talking about a symphonic hybrid approach. So symphonic is uh, an old approach of using an orchestral like uh, mm -hmm. orchestra, you know yeah. what I mean? With the strings, with the bones, with the horns, with the, everything. And the hybrid side of it is the ability to use synthesizers, keyboards, sounds that they are not coming actually from an orchestra piece. Mm -hmm. And somehow make them work together. For me, it felt like the right approach for this because this is so uh, out of space. This is so uh, uh, beyond just here's a violin play. And a lot of time I can impress express this kind of things with a synthesizer, with a mm -hmm. keyboard sound, because what is it exactly? You really don't know, and this is what's nice about it. Mm -hmm. And so the combination of the two things together, I think, really helped telling the story, and the story had a, a lot of um, uh, unknown mystery, mm -hmm. risk, um, a lot of hope in it, and all those things that you can use this language and actually try and find what's the music that will help to enhance that. Yeah, um, definitely that was one of the notes that I took very clearly was the sound of risk. Mm -hmm. And I think there are these not necessarily cluttered synthesizer, uh, synthesizer noises, but they are very impactful. And I think there is a good tension build with that. And, you know, you said it was something like a magic. Do you just seem to be hearing it more and then you make the visual audio connection mentally or do you go in with a very specific type of plan to chop so, it through? So it's a good question. So there is a process when you, before you start to compose, mm -hmm. um, there's a pre-production and there's a, and you talk about the direction and a way that could be happening is that, that you hear something very clear that you want to do. Mm -hmm. And the other option is you find, um, examples you find models mm -hmm. so you can find different models from classical pieces of music or records that you know or, or mm -hmm. out of soundtrack that you think wow this is actually interesting and then you can actually take this piece of music and put it under your movie mm -hmm. and of course you cannot use it because it's not yours but it's just an example of a certain emotion that you can say ah, i don't like it or oh yeah i really like it so why do I like about this piece of music? Oh, this piece of music, I really like the tonality, or I like the pace of it, or I like the, the, the movement that makes this kind of uh, edge, because it's an edgy scene. And then you take this off and you compose your own thing, but now you gave yourself kind of a frame what to work on. And for me, a lot of the, my process, um, and in this case, I did the same thing, I brought in, um, my friend David Leon, he's a music supervisor, and, and I like to work with him a lot because we have good communication, and David is very good with watching it from the outside as a supervisor mm -hmm. and uh, see if it's telling the story good enough or not. And by this, it's giving me the ability to dive really deep mm -hmm. into that direction I chose to go and come back out of the water, and then they have sometimes a partner and be like, okay, so yeah. what do you think about what I did? So. Just to sum this, for me, the process a lot of time is I try to program myself to my best of my ability to understand what I'm trying to achieve here, what's the direction, what's the framework. And as I get this process to the best ability that I can, then it makes my creative process very easy because I trust that I program myself to get something and now I can dive into the magic and the unknown but the parameters are there and I know if I'm going too far or to one side or another compared to if I just jump at something with no framework or nothing it could be anything it could be nothing yeah it's a very um, micro versus macro mm -hmm. view of the situation it's very similar to somebody who specializes in the chemical formula to build a certain type of anti-heat panel and then there's somebody who sits 30 feet above the telescope looking down from the guardrail, making sure that type of thin cellophane, less than an inch uh, wrap, mm -hmm. fits over everything. Exactly. Yeah. Um, how, do you ever look back at previous work that you've done as kind of the model for future projects? It's actually a good point. Uh, Yes, and, and in this case, what was interesting is I just did a project for uh, 
the museum for the Academy of Motion Picture opened a, a museum in LA, mm -hmm. and I got hired to do some music for them. And one of the things that they asked me to do was um, uh, ten pieces of uh, of one minute music that presents different genres, so they can use it in their application. And and we worked. David was with me on this project too, and mm -hmm. it was good because he brought a lot of great examples, and we sipped through a lot of stuff that the curator gave us. And in the end, we uh, did ten pieces of this. It was some of it hybrid too, orchestra, mm -hmm. and, and then when I got hired to do the NASA project, mm -hmm. the guy that hired me uh, visited me here in the studio, and it was very good timing because I could play him a couple of the pieces of music I did for the museum, and this would lock the deal. The deal was there already, but for him, mm -hmm. he listened to this and said, wow, this is what I want. If you can now take the quality, what you did here, the emotional quality and the, the orchestral stuff and the hybrid into telling the story of my movie, I think we got it made. So this mm -hmm. answer, yes, you can go back. And sometimes you don't, but through many years of working on a lot of things, I can definitely get a project and think, oh, wow, this is going to remind me of what I did 10 years ago and this and this, and I go back and I play to myself. And sometimes I'm like, wow, this is a great direction. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. Not close, not close enough, but it's showing me what it's not. So yes, going back to your question, yeah, I can go back a lot of time into other projects I did and see if I can bring something from there. Do you work with David Leon a lot? I've been working with David pretty much in the last ten years on a lot of projects. The the, the first project we did together was David was a music supervisor for Marvel. Mm -hmm. And I ran into him in uh, uh, a concert, the B-52. A, mu oh. a, mu a mutual yeah. friend, Paul Gordon, was the keyboard player, uh, background singer, super, super talented guy. He passed away a few years ago. But he was a super nice guy. And uh, he was in town, and he called me, and he invited me to the show. And I went to the show, and when I went backstage to see him after the show, I met he, he introduced me to David. Mm -hmm. And David is a music supervisor, and I'm a composer, musician. And then we, David said he's looking for material for uh, Marvel for um, the Avengers TV show. This was before mm -hmm. the first of Avenger movie, so this was 2009. Mm -hmm. And then after we met, we talked on the phone, and we clicked. We had a good vibe, and and David says, "Yeah, do you wanna? I'll send you a song riff for you to write another option." Because he he said he ran. Um, this thing to like 10 composers in town all of them did a version but Marvel didn't really like any one of the versions so they're looking to do another round mm -hmm. and just from my experience with this thing I thought you know I paid attention when I met David in the same evening somebody says a musician and then I said to him oh are you a musician and he said to me oh it's a long story mm -hmm. and I think there's a good story here to tell is that you have to be present as much as you can and pay attention because when this thing came up and mm -hmm. he said, oh, it's a long story, I realized that he has something to do with making music too, not just being a supervisor, but it's complicated because the way he said it. Mm -hmm. So when he asked me if I want to do it, I asked him, I said, tell me if I'm crossing a line, do you want to do it with me? Mm -hmm. And I think that I touched in a place that maybe if I didn't do it, who knows what. And he said, oh, yeah, I would love to do it with you. So we got to work together, and what worked really well is that the song needed lyrics. And David was very good with understanding of the whole Marvel characters and what the adventure is. So I did most of the music, and he worked main, more on the, on the lyrics. And somehow we walked it all the way to and, and got this theme to be the theme for the Avengers, Mighties, Heroes, whatever it was, a TV show on Disney for a couple of years, very successful mm -hmm. as part of the campaign to start the, the Avengers movie. Then David's boss asked us to do a theme for something that ended up being um, a theme for Sea Rescue, a TV show that we end up doing not just a theme, but 200 episodes. Mm -hmm. And then we got another show, and then we got another Marvel thing to do. So yes, to answer your question, I work with him on a lot of things, and I think we're a good team because we are we have enough in common and we have enough, even more than the in common, that not in common. So his skills with my skills together, I think, are creating a, a complete package for someone that needs music. Because David is very good with the vision and paperwork and 
cue sheets and and very good with translating and a lot of time my work is to work with executives mm -hmm. that they try to get something but they don't really know how to explain what they want and David been doing it for many years so yes so we've been doing a lot of projects and it's been great awesome to ask uh, a specific question were the drums created live or were those created uh, virtually right so the drums everything in the beginning was done here on my keyboards basically mm -hmm me playing all the parts and having all the sounds in my computer. Then the second stage was to decide what do I want to have uh, live musicians play on top. So so a lot of the strings, of course, the orchestra. So yes, I went to a studio with my friend Asher Fedi, a fantastic drummer um, and a good friend. And uh, he basically played those big on, on, on real drums. and. And I think in the end I combined it with the samples. Mm -hmm. So, but but yeah, but I really wanted to have the live yeah. feel of a human playing it, and and adding the sample just even for more power. Yeah, I thought the drums were really impressive. Like it was very, you know, it's not ever too loud or ever too imposing over the rest of what's going on, but it is does really carry that kind of risk. You know, what is worth the risk? They've put two billion dollars into the project. They've put twenty years into the project. Ten billions, I think. Ten billion. Ten billion dollars. Nine, wow. Now it's nine is going to end up being ten. You know, to make this point, and thanks for recognizing that I come from making records. Mm -hmm. So my approach is not so much as a typical composer, and because I think through the years of making records, I realize how much the human feel has to add to things, even if you don't understand it. Mm -hmm. So I end up a lot of time making stuff like a record. It means it needs to sound right, it needs to feel right. Mm -hmm. But I think some composers in the old traditional way, they just do it everything in MIDI and not with as much care and uh, focus on tone and feel because they come from a different field of making a lot of minutes of music and it's background music. Yeah. But I think for someone like me that come from many, many, many years of uh, making music as front, so when you make a record, it's not going to be behind anything. Mm -hmm. So you're going to close your eyes and listen to the song or to the piece of music, and the only thing that stands for is for the music. Yeah. Everything that we played on has to be the right part in the arrangement, played in the right hands of the right person, with the right instrument, mic'd in the right way, and mixed in the right way. And I think that this is what I take pride, and I hope I can bring more and more from this into the world of composing because naturally this is my approach it's actually a good question you ask another person will say ah the samples are good enough let's leave the sample i really believe that someone when somebody plays it he means it too and he lays it to his drums it brings uh, a different thing yeah technology is really um an ability for us to enhance our own human experience it's not a replacement tool you know the telescope, the James Webb telescope, doesn't replace our, you know, human observation of the sky. It enhances it. Mm -hmm. It pushes the ability for us to reach farther or further and further into space. Yes. In the same way that samples and the ability to mix things electronically and do things like auto-tune don't replace the human voice. They don't just replace enhance. The, yeah. Exactly. Just enhance. And I think that... Um, with your background, you really do view it as a tool and not the only way to do something. Right. And I think that, you know, much like um, combining orchestral instruments with, uh, like, virtual instruments, it is, you know, a give and take between two things that yes, I agree. create, like, there a great product. There are types of music mm -hmm. that actually rely on technology and those things as the but it's a different type of music, mm -hmm. so it, it's very, some electronic music. But again, I think it comes from the creativity of the person. And then now it's just a, a painter, and he sits and it just depends on what colors he has to use, or what colors does he wants to mix, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So this is the, the beautiful of freedom of creativity. Um, I think for people, it's like, because it can sound very much, but it's the truth, anything is possible. Mm -hmm. When I go in front of her, I can do anything I want. I can decide instead of drum dish just to take trash cans and hit them, whatever, if if necessary. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do it just because. But so I think that this would keep draws me back and back into what I do, is that time after time I'm just like in front of this, I can do whatever I want. I can try. Yes, and certain projects have a 
structure. But even inside the structure, this is the reason they come to composer, artist, whatever. Make it special. It has to. It has to be special. It has to be something that you are inspired by when you're making it. For to have the chance for somebody to hear it to get inspired. Because mm -hmm. if you're not, and it's just more on mechanical, or more like a craft, which sometimes it is. It's not the most inspiring. So for me, I'm very fortunate through my career to have a nice amount of projects that are really special, really inspiring. And then, yeah, and then nuts and bolts, and sometimes you have to, you know what I mean? So when you work on a TV show and you do 200 episodes, after a while you're recycling a lot of what you did, and there's no need to create new pieces of music because you already created the tone for it. So it's become a little bit more craft, but I think it's very important for everybody to work to have enough artistic projects to keep your inspiration. Definitely. So what's next for you? What do you um, have on the docket, if you can say? Right. Um, so I have I have a tour that's scheduled two weeks from today. The first show is supposed to start. It's uh, 17 days, nine or ten shows in the East Coast with Alan, um, which, if it will happen, will be the first tour we did in two years. Pretty sad. Oh. You know what I mean? 2020 was supposed to be a very busy year for us, and it got stopped. Um, so I'm crossing my finger this is going to happen, but I'm flexible. If it's not, not meant to be, it's going to happen mm -hmm. later. Um, uh, finishing those, there's on the new album that Alan's make, there's two songs I co-wrote. So I'm trying to help Alan or some guys to get those to the best shape in matter of overdubs and everything before he um, start to mix those. Mm -hmm. And um, David and me, we have a uh, few projects in the pipeline that we uh, are nurturing and um, working on. So I cannot talk about some of them yet, but mm -hmm. this is what's nice about it. So it's like I, I can do the stuff with Alan and I can do my sessions when I get called. People send me files and I lay base on stuff. And, and then I do the stuff with David when we develop and, and kind of have relationship with people that are now working on a lot of projects. Mm -hmm. So. So it's a good scope between uh, studio work and then playing live, which mm -hmm. it gives me a nice uh, balance. Yeah. You know, the two biggest things I've taken away um, from our discussion right now is, or our conversation right now, is really the balance between two things that are on opposite ends of, like most other things, it's like a bell curve. Mm -hmm. And the space between two opposite ends is usually smaller than the space in the middle. And the importance of having multiple ways of walking down the street. Like, you're obviously a talented musician. What can you do with that besides playing live music? Mm -hmm. You've demonstrated that through engineering, scoring, creating these connections within the industry, making, you know, present collaborative relationships with people like David Leon. I think my... Um, last question would be something about, you know, maybe some advice for somebody who is maybe younger in their craft and is only kind of accessing one portion of the music industry, right. per se, and how they can, you know, reach a more boulevard-style approach to that. Nice. Good question. Um, I think it's... It has to be, um, you have to be open-minded, but it has to be something that fits you. So let me try and focus my answer. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do in the music business, let's say, if we call it music business, whatever left yeah. out of it. But it's very individual, and you have to, the same thing I can say, I learned through the years what I'm good in and what I'm not good in. And I think that this where comes maybe a advice that I can give. Because I knew that I'm not good in organizations and uh, the corporate world. And uh, the, to, to, I never worked in any company in my life. I knew that I needed help with it. So somehow I attract David Leon into my life because mm -hmm. he's very good with this. And by partnering with him, what people get on the outside is the full package. They don't care who does what. But before mm -hmm. I had it... I was missing something, I was lacking. So one thing is to realize what you're not good in that you need help with and find the help. If it's help that you pay someone to do it for you, mm -hmm. or if you partner with someone, or whatever. And then on the 
flip side of what you're talking about, what you're good in, you have to kind of see what kind of gets you excited. So let's say someone is a piano player. And this is how he gets into uh, the business. He plays piano for people or he starts to do stuff. And then he can tell that he's really gravitating toward even specific scoring but documentaries for some reason. It's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay. It's good because if you have a passion to something that's very specific, you're probably going to find a way to do it. It might develop later, but compared to people sitting giving advice and be like, you should uh, learn how to produce, you should learn how to write songs, you should learn how to compose, you should... it's too many things and it's too general. You don't mm -hmm. learn things in general. This guy ends up playing piano and not oboe and a trumpet and a guitar because you have to s go after what, whatever. So the same way, take the, your starting point and see what really inspire you and start and search into this direction and now you expand so now you're a piano player and now you score but actually uh, intimate score of just more piano and small instruments for documentaries oh but because of it you run into someone and now something happened and now they allow you to score this big thing and now you have to learn this other thing but it has to come i think from a pure drive that comes from passion and not by somebody dumping you at school and say okay so you went to school now you're going to learn one day, you're going to be in the studio as an engineer. One day, you're going to produce one, and the guy's like, I don't want an engineer. I'm not even good with it. Oh, no, but you have to do it all. No, no, you don't have to do it all. You can collaborate with other people. They, they are passionate about engineering, and no, you not as much, and together you get the best out of it. So, to sum it, you have to look deep inside, or even just watch yourself on the side and see what you get excited about. Because mm -hmm. whatever you get excited about, it means that there's something for you there. And it might lead you later to other way, but s stick with what you do and start to branch out. But branch out to my again. This is my opinion, not from here, mm -hmm. because somebody told you, "Hey, it's a good niche. Go do this thing." You're gonna end up being jaded and doing something you don't like. Do something that you're excited about, because things that we're excited about, we're putting hours in, and we don't even know we put the hours in. We'll go into it and work every day, and people say, "Oh, wow, is it tough work?" It's not even work. Because you're excited about. So. Awesome. Thank you. You got it. <laughs>